Well, Shabbat Shalom, y'all. Shabbat Shalom. I'm a Southern Baptist pastor. <laughs> Though a lot of people don't know that. There was a, uh, uh, a movement uh, in the Southern Baptist Convention to pray for Israel and reach them with the gospel. Yes. And I said, guys, say it differently. And they said, no. I said, say it differently. Because it sounds like what you're saying is, I don't want you to be Jews anymore. Exactly. I want you to be Baptists. Right? Uh, that's a scary thing. Right? It's not good news to a Jew. This is Stuart Dowerman's quote. Right. It's not good news to a Jew to tell him that all of your relatives are lost and you get to be a Baptist or a Presbyterian. That's not good news, right? So I'm going to tell you my story. I, Bruce uh, talked to me wanted to have me come out, wasn't sure what for. <laughs> I don't, I, everywhere I go, people will say something about, about me, and I go, I don't, I don't think you know who I am. So, so I'm not, I, I'm pretty well known. I don't know how I'm seen, so we'll see how that goes. But I'm glad to come out, and he said, he'd heard a sermon and said, you, you can do that, and I thought, <laughs> Just come in, I don't know you, you don't know me. So I thought, I'd take the risk of telling you who I am tonight, mm -hmm. and where my heart is, mm -hmm. and why I want to connect. And then you can decide if you want me back, and then I'll get serious, right? <laughs> so I want to tell you how I got into the Messianic movement. I grew up in a very, very abusive home. Uh, it was not a Christian home. I remember going to church one time when I was 10, maybe 11, and uh, the pastor, I didn't know what was going on. I, it was kind of weird. The pastor asked questions and answers, and I raised my hand, and I said, I want to know what the H stands for. And he said, what? I said, in Jesus H. Christ, because that's the only words I'd heard. I have an H in my name, H. Bruce. I thought that was... Boy, they were not happy with me, right? So I didn't have a good experience. Later, I came back to the church. I was about 12, 12 and a half, and a fireman came, and he told about heaven and hell, and he took a woman's hairspray can and a flame and shot it. I was sitting right over there. And then he said, who doesn't want to go to hell? <laughs> I was living in it at home. I didn't want that there. You know. I had a very abusive dad. So around, so I said the magic words. They told me say these words. Right. And, you know, now you're a Christian, right? Uh, go home and uh, whatever you ask God, He'll give you. I went home and asked God to kill my dad. Yeah. And he had a heart attack the next week, and it scared me to death. Because I thought I caused it. Sure. Then he had a stroke. Then he had a heart attack. Ended up having seven strokes and eight heart attacks Ooh. over a period of six years before he died. Now, I was out of the house before that and living on the streets and sleeping in people's houses and friends. And a black friend of mine, Tyrone, brought me back home to his mom in Santa Ana and said, he followed me home, can I keep him? <laughs> and Aunt May said, yes, right? She gave us the garage, so in the 1960s, 65, 66, right in there, I became a poor black child. <laughs> and I moved into the garage at 3rd and Bristol in San Now That was an interesting time in the 60s. Right. And I was called a lot of things in those days because there was, there was tension. But it made me kind of interested in culture. So I was doing some rock and roll music with a friend of mine. We were doing pretty well. And um, uh, there was a group that was really famous from Santa Ana High School called the Righteous Brothers. And we got connected to them. And they said, you're going up to Hollywood to try to do some recordings and make play. We just opened a new recording studio in Tustin. You should come there. So I thought, we've got it made, right? <laughs> so I go in there, and they start having a fight, and within a few weeks, they broke up. That was the end of my music career. <laughs> so a friend says, 
I need you to come and play the bass at a Youth for Christ meeting. I said, I don't want to go to a Youth for Christ meeting. He said, there are girls there. And I said, what time is that? <laughs> so I went to the Garden Grove Friends Church, where they had the Youth for Christ rallies. And I played the bass. This guy played the guitar. And we were kind of doing a Smothers Brothers. Uh, uh, Tom just died. Uh, we were trying, we were doing a thing like that. We call ourselves him and the other guy. I don't know which one I was, but that was it. So we're playing, I'm playing a bass, slapping it, doing this stuff. Then this guy gets up to talk, right? Now remember, I don't know anything about church. So at the end, they're all singing this song. And my friend starts walking down the aisle. I thought he was going to get the instrument. So I followed him down the aisle and walked right into the counseling room. And this big football player says, do you know God loves you has a wonderful plan for your life? I said, I've been through this before. I don't need to. I just came for the girls and, I, and to get my base. And he says, what do you mean you've done this before? I said, I, I said the Jesus thing. And he says, I'm not talking about the Jesus thing. I'm talking about lordship. I never heard that. He says, no, you don't just believe in him. You have to follow him. Follow him where? Right? He's using words I don't know. Right? So he tells me about it. I said this, God, if, if you're real, you're going to have to work this through me because I, I don't get it. Right? So I get baptized. That didn't work out so well. It was July 4th, I think 1966. We're in there. Little Corona on the beach side, not the side where Calvary Chapel went. We were on the ocean side. So the pastor put me in the water and undertow grabbed me and took me up. And I got up and I swam back and the deacon said, is that good? He says, he went under, he came up, that's a baptism. Right? So that was my, nobody discipled me, but because I had a musical background, Youth for Christ starts pulling me in. And I start doing YFC rallies, and I start copying other people's sermons, and, and every time I go, Lord, if I didn't accept you last time, I really, because I was, I, I was a mess, right? And I met this girl, and I married her. <laughs> we married in a four-square church. Her dad was a Pentecostal preacher, Italian. Pentecostal. That's a hugging group. Yes. We get married in the Four Square Church. The next day, I become the associate pastor of a friend's church, Quaker church. Whoa. So I start baptizing the youth and having communion, and they don't do that. The pastor says, We don't baptize, we dry clean. <laughs> Because the friends said, you guys are all fighting over it. We're not going to do it. Oh, okay. Right? So then the yearly meeting calls and says, what is that guy doing? I said, well, he doesn't really know. <laughs> and I'm coming apart because of the background. Belief I killed my dad. All this stuff going on. Yeah. Linda's pregnant. And I leave the ministry and I want nothing to do with God anymore. I'm done. Tyrone's working for a security company. I go to work carrying a gun in anger, all this stuff. I won't let Linda go to church. I want nothing to do with this, nothing. One night, I'm at a place called Melody Land, oh, yeah. across from Disneyland. Yes. Their kids are cruising, and somebody's got a gun, and I'm undercover, and I, I tell the Anaheim PD, I see the guy with the gun, I'll block him and you get him. I start pulling my car going, I've got the lights out. I reach under to get the lights. I'm accelerating, I get up to about 45 miles an hour, bam, right into those cement blocks that hold the big poles, and the steer I didn't have a seatbelt on, because I was going to get out, and the steering wheel, well, the car stopped, oh and I didn't stop, and the steering wheel went right through my face, oh, wow. shoved all my teeth in, split my lip up here, I used to be gorgeous. <laughs> This plastic surgeon guy puts my face together and he says, you're, you're not going to be able to feel this side of your mouth. You're going to lose all your teeth. And I knew I was done. Linda said when she saw me in the hospital, she knew God had stopped me. I was done. 
So I now feel disqualified from ministry or anything else. We go into a church where the pastor really understood grace and understood God, and he kept talking to me from the pulpit. I hate that. <laughs> the Bible says this, doesn't it, Bruce? <laughs> See, because I'd studied the Bible, I wanted to get free of it. And what I realized is it was saying things that I wasn't told. I never got told any of that stuff. That the God I believed in was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yeah. That's not just any old to whom it may concern, right? There's a, it's a real God who revealed himself, right? So I then, the pastor says, He's got cancer. He's going to die. I'm going to see another father figure die, this time one of faith. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he says to me, you've got to go back to school. I'm 28. i got two kids. I'm a mess. But, I, but I'm in a church now that's relational. Mm -hmm. They're relational. Mm -hmm. And I'm beginning to see what relational love can do for me. Mm -hmm. So what I do is... I go to school. Now, I graduated from a continuation high school. I don't figure I'm going to make it through school. But in that time, I had gotten some experience. So every class I took, I wanted to major in that. <laughs> Ended up triple majoring in psychology, sociology, and anthropology. Started in music, but to too many performance classes, I was done with that. In that context, I found the tools to think about culture, and I discovered something. All the cultures of the world, every culture of the world goes back to Babel. And Babel, God scattered them, right? He confounded the languages, which is why we speak these confounded languages. Right? <laughs> and spread them all over the earth, right? And we began to phenotypically change so that we looked a little different as we adapted to the environment. Because we're all from one blood. We all came from single people. Right? And then basically he divided us and conquered us. We don't trust each other. We're fighting right. war, 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 war. Right. Then it dawned on me. Israel is the only culture that God created himself. He said, I don't want you walking like an Egyptian. I, I don't want you walking like a Canaanite. Right? You're going to walk in my statutes in my ways. Right. He created them to be a culture that reflected his glory as a light to the nations. And I thought, oh, this is special revelation. Jesus is special revelation. Israel is special revelation. And that gave me an understanding that I had to get myself back to that foundation of what this faith was all about. So I started looking around for the Messianic movement, but I had an experience at school that really, really affected me. I had a Jewish professor, a psychology professor. She was wonderful. One day she calls me into her office at the end of the semester, and whenever somebody calls me into their office, <laughs> I think I'm in trouble. I spent more time in the principal's office than he did. So, you know. <clears throat> she says, you're a minister, aren't you? I said, yes. She says, would you be willing to baptize my sons? Ooh. And I said, have they become believers in Jesus? She goes, oh no, we live in Fairfax, we're Jews. I said, I know. She says, we're moving out of Fairfax into Huntington Beach. And I've heard that there's a lot of anti-Semitism there. And I thought if they had bas baptismal certificates, they'd be left alone. <laughs> now, when I lived with the Trips, the black family, I understood the sensitivity of what racism had done to them. I'd never thought of that with Jewish people. And I went home and I got on my knees and I said, God, no Jewish person is ever going to be afraid of my faith in their Messiah, yes. if I can have anything to do with it. Amen. So I started looking for 
something that would help me with that. And I read David Stern, David Stern of Blessed oh, yeah. Memory. I read his book, The Messianic Manifesto. And I said, that's it. It's Messianic Judaism. And so I flew to Israel to meet David, and he was in the United States. <laughs> so I met Joe Shulam. I don't know if you know Joe Shulam, but he's a trip. Okay? And he started telling me stuff, and other Messianics there told me stuff. I came back and started studying for my PhD, the Messianic Movement. I was the first anthropologist, behavioral scientist, to study the movement that wasn't a theological study, but a psychological identity study. Mm -hmm. And I did that at, at UCR. In the process, I began to become friends with many of the rabbis and the messianics in that context. Now, I'm comfortable being a Gentile. I don't have any wannabe feelings. Okay? Uh, God is the God of Israel, and he's the God of the nations, right? Yes, amen. He made us first. We messed it up. <laughs> then he made Israel to be alive, right? So we need to be together. So I'm trying to figure out how to do this. How do I do this without being a copycat messianic, right? So meeting people like Stuart Dowerman and others, I decided that what we needed was a linkage between Israel and the nations. And that linkage are the believers in Yeshua, the ones from the nations and the ones from Israel coming together so that we have Messianic Judaism and Judeo-Christianity, a Christianity that is founded in Judaism and influenced by Judaism, but doesn't make us Jews. So I always tell the guys, I'm their favorite goy for you. So, my congregation, the Disciple Center, is a Judeo-Christian congregation that uses the, here's my view, Judaism and Christianity, our mother and our father, got a divorce. They told the children, those aren't really your brothers and sisters, <laughs> all right, right? Yeah. Your dad's the Antichrist. Your mother's the great harlot of Babylon, right? You know how divorce families do, right? And so we got split. Then they started living with other people, and there's all kinds of crap in the garage and in the house. So what we have to do, Messianic Jews and Judeo-Christians, is we've got to go through the garage and find the stuff that's really ours and bring them back together and become brother and sister. We can't do that organizationally. So now I'm to my text. You don't have to bring it back. But I, I'm going to give you this. Ephesians chapter 4. Paul says, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, in all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Not the unity of the doctrine. Doctrine is important. But it's not the unity of the doctrine. Not unity of practice. Okay? If, the Lord's, if the Lord was right here and invisible, and he told you come, and he told you come, and you, you, nobody can see, and you're walking this way, and you're walking this way, everybody's going to go, one of you is wrong. Neither one is wrong. We're coming from different places. We've got to give each other some patience and some tolerance and allow each other to grow in grace and in knowledge together. Walk with each other where we can walk with each other and where we disagree, we'll just let it percolate a little bit. You know, We just rip each other apart and say, you're not really of the body. We're not supposed to do that. And we're really not supposed to do that, especially of the natural branches, even the ones broken off. So we're connected to Israel, even Israel that's unbelieving. Yes. Right? Yes. We need yes. relationships in all the denominations. Yes. Yes. It's relationships, not organizations. God Amen. works through people. Yes. Amen. People work through organizations. There's no church that God started. Amen. Right? And if you want to see Satan, go to the Southern Baptist Convention, 
Vatican and Salt Lake City because all of the organizations are where he sows discord among the brethren, right? There are good people in all the denominations, godly people struggling to find God through the prism that they've got. We've got to find each other. We've got to find the remnant and make relationships. And so that's why when Bruce said, I want to be connected to you relationally and not necessarily organizationally, yeah. he's talking my language. Amen. Okay? So that's what we need to be, especially if persecution comes. It's coming it's here. It's Yeshua here. said, yeah. oh, sorry, when persecution <laughs> Yeshua said, because of lawlessness, Torah lessons, mm -hmm. the love of many shall wax cold. He's talking about believers. Right. And yes. brother will betray brother to yes. death. Mm -hmm. yes. If we have to agree on doctrine and mm -hmm. practice, mm -hmm. We're going to turn each other in. Yes. Yeah. But if we're relationally connected and I love you and you love me and I'm willing to die for you, even though you're wrong on that point, right? <laughs> and I'm willing to die for you even though I don't practice it quite the way you do, that shows the sign of discipleship. By this sign, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. All right. Well, I think I've overstayed my welcome. No, no. <laughs> so I'll tell you what I usually do at the end of all of my messages. We don't have an invitation because we're a private congregation. That's got its own thing. When you tell people you have a private congregation, they demand to come. Right? It's really weird. But we're trying to protect the congregation. We need it to be a safe place for us. Then we go out and minister in the name of the Lord. But when we come in here, we're coming in to be the body. Yeah. We're coming in to be one of, uh, members not only of him, but members of one another. So what I always do at the end is a Q&A so that you can ask questions about what I said, clarification, so that you don't go out and bear false witness about what I was really saying. Right? <laughs> so let me pray for you, and then if you have a Q&A, we can do that, okay. uh, whatever you want to do. Okay. Father, I thank you for these wonderful people, for the spirit that is in this place, uh, that is genuine and authentic. And I ask the Lord that you would bless them in all that they do. Let them be a shining witness in this area to your people and to those who dwell with Israel. And we ask God for the peace of Jerusalem Pray for the release of the hostages yes. and the confusing of Hamas as you have done with the enemies of Israel so many times before. And we pray, Lord, that we will not betray one another, but that we will be relationally connected and see ourselves as brothers and sisters, fathers and mothers, children of the living God. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of of Israel. We ask it in Hashem Yeshua. Amen. Amen. All right. Anybody got something you want to ask? Yes. I have a question. I saw something on uh, TV, uh, uh, one of these programs where they interview a guy who wrote a book. And uh, I can't remember his name. His last name was Alberta, I think. He wrote mm -hmm. a book. He's a Christian. And his big thing was the problems going on in a lot of Christian churches now where the pastor is taking up some political stand, and uh, a lot of people are drawn to that because you know it's like gang warfare I want to belong yeah. to your gang yeah so is that a, something that we should definitely understand or yeah we need to be aware of that in the 1980s Jerry Falwell uh, uh, James Kennedy and James Dobson <coughs> began to push a movement called the moral majority and this idea that we're going to win the America back to Christ, but we're going to do it politically. Uh, that always bothered me. It's not by might, it's not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord, right? We don't do it. And so what did, what did we do? The first thing they did was get a born-again president in. It was Jimmy Carter. And they weren't happy with it, right? So the reality is, Politically, we're not doing, I always have to tell my congregation, this happened with the COVID thing and all that stuff. 
when they go, they rise up, I say, are you rising up as a Christian or as an American? Because I get it, okay? I, I was born in 1950, right? I come right after World War II. We were patriotic. We were all of that stuff. And we thought God was an American and Jesus was born in Oklahoma. <laughs> like we sang Old Little Town of Bakersfield and we did it all, right? We somehow we blurred all that stuff. America is not a Christian nation. It never was. It was a nation that was Christian friendly and influenced. And it is rapidly ripping that influence yes, yes. off and it's going to blame us for all their ills yes. and they're coming mm -hmm. after us. It starts with the Jews, they're the, they're the miner's canary. Always. And then it goes to those who love Israel and the God of Israel. Yes, yes. We have to stay connected to the Israel of God and the God of Israel because that's who Yeshua is. Mm -hmm. So I think we don't do the political stuff. Amen. Yeah. I um, am like you. I came out of, if you will, an American Baptist church. Mm -hmm. uh, they did a wonderful job in teaching me and uh, establishing my understanding of the Bible to a point. Yeah. But um, I now join with my Jewish friends as a sojourner, if you will. Yes. And so, um, how do you how do you deal with that from your stage? Um, I guess I would say that um, when I hear Southern Baptist, I'm actually the one that broke up a Southern Baptist um, Bible study mm -hmm. because I was pushing Yeshua. Yeah. Well, you know, you know, there's one thing that Baptists and Jews are alike. Two Jews, three opinions. Uh -huh. Two Baptists, Five seven or eight. Mm -hmm. right? And so, uh, you know, there's that kind of problem. But there are there are people who will hear. Paul, uh, John's very clear about this. The ones who are of the world hear the world. The ones who are of the Spirit hear us because we speak from the Spirit. So that discernment is what we have to do. Uh, I'm not going to reject an entire group because there are some bad ones in there, right? But I have to navigate through them. So we have to be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. Most of us are dumb as an ox and like a bull in a china shop, right? And we want to not do that. Right? So you tread carefully. And, yes, I agree. Love. Especially with Jews. Especially He's with saying Jews. especially with Jews. But you trade carefully. Yeah, I, I, you know what I what I find? Um, our congregation, we get all of our Judaica from the local Jewish stores, right? And I would say, what are you guys doing? Say, we, we love your God. That's why we're here. So. And, well, we'll give you a discount. No, you won't give us a discount. We're here to support you. And then they want to know what's different about us and other so-called <laughs> And that's okay because you're a Gentile. Yes, but you know, that's what Paul says. Our job is to provoke Israel to jealousy. Now, how do we do that? A kid has a toy and they're neglecting it. Until another kid goes, wow. Like, Mom, they want it, right? So what we're just doing is we're going, wow, to the Jewish stuff to the Torah stuff, and they go, hey, that's ours. We say, yes, it is. <laughs> that's all we do. And there's more that you don't know about, and we just go, yeah. But, so, I, I'm sorry, Ruth oh, I, 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 It's more of a comment, not a question, because at, can I, when you started, I want to go back to something you said, and, and that is um, when we witnessed or and become relational with Jews. <clears throat> Most believers, what they want to, they say, oh, come to church. I'm like, that's the last thing they want to hear. Yeah, we never do that. Yeah. That's why we have a private congregation. We never invite people to church. We invite them into our homes for a Shabbat meal. 
We invite them into our homes for the lighting of the Hanukkah candles. We invite, we let them invite us in because they hear about us doing a Seder. Would you do one over for us? We'll do that, right? And then with, what I try to make is if a non-Yeshua Jewish person comes in to our congregation or anything we're doing, they will recognize their stuff being handled with respect, mm -hmm. but subtly different than them because we're deferring to they are the ones to whom those things were given. Yes. And you, we have to work very carefully at that. Mm -hmm. I think Ruth Anna has a question. Oh. Yeah. How do you um, work with someone who is not only Jewish, but an atheist, and they on top of it? Um, and we've been praying for them and attempting to witness in some way or another for years. But when, when you, uh, they will tell you this Bible is not reliable because it's historically inaccurate. And there's so many more books than the research. And, and I actually have a book um, at home, and it's what every Jew needs to know about Judaism. And they refer to all of these things as uh, like wives' tales. As, as the rabbis talk about it, they're talking about as if you know, they, don't, they don't believe it. That book's out of the reform movement. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. Secular Jews. Mm -hmm. Now, I never bring a secular Jew to Jesus. I have to bring them to the God of Israel first then to the covenant, mm -hmm. then to the Messiah. Mm -hmm. So you have to do that developmentally, right? If you go straight to Jesus, do not pass go, do not collect mm -hmm. any <laughs> Torah commandments, right? You, that that won't work. Door. So I, I, I have to affirm their identity. Mm -hmm. they, have to, yes. they have to return to God first. Mm -hmm. okay? Now, I, people can't do that Bible stuff with me because I'm an anthropologist. And I'm on the translation team of the New American Standard Bible. And I uh, was a, a consultant to the Tree of Life Bible and mm -hmm. David Stern's study Bible. So I know a little bit more about the biblical text. So when somebody tells me that these are not real things, I can go after them. I can't give you that. I simply have a different trajectory for that. Mm -hmm. I don't argue with people who want to argue. Because all they want to do is argue. Yes. And that's a lot like marriage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just, that's a joke. Um, so so the, the thing is, the Bible says, answer a fool according to his folly. Exactly. According right to after it says, folly. don't answer a fool according to his folly. You have to know what kind of fool you're dealing with. Oh. One who doesn't believe in God because he doesn't get it or one who doesn't believe in God because he's unwilling yeah. to believe in God. Yes. I, don't, I don't throw pearls before swine. Thank right. you. Mm -hmm. that's, that's good. And, pearls and before swine. One of the that's questions, what, yes. what do you think, um, I've seen so many phenomenal testimonies on One for Israel, mm -hmm. and their podcasts are just dynamic. Um, you, I don't want to say what's your judgment on that, but... Is because they're saying now more and more young people in Israel are coming to faith in Yeshua. Yeah, they're actually, I've, I've been getting, I don't know if you get many reports from Israel. Sorry. But there's actually been some Messianics who are now in the I, IDF, IDF, right? Yes, in the IDF. Who, because of their faith expression in the battle, are making some of the others ask them about Yeshua. So this is this is a time for us to be praying for a lot of things. Uh, I think your words are right that Hamas means it for evil, but God can do can turn anything into good. Doesn't mean anything is good, but He can bring good out of any of those things. So I, I think we I think we need to be praying for that. What is your response uh, when people are saying that? Um, 
Yeah, I was going to say that. I and that, you know, the Old Testament is no longer valid, yeah. and that the people of Israel are not the chosen one anymore, because that's what is happening in Christianity yeah. right Yeah, replacement and theology. That came out of the Reformation. Yeah. So here's, here's how it works. The Old Testament was replaced with the New Testament. The law was replaced with the gospel. Works was replaced with grace, right? Israel was replaced with the church, right? Now, I was taught that. I believe that. In fact, I'll tell you how bad I was. I had a friend try to tell me something about the Old Testament, and one Christmas I sent him a Hanukkah card. Okay? I mean, I was, I was steeped in that nonsense. So here's the deal. Jesus didn't die to get rid of the law. He came to bring the law into full operation. When he returns, the kingdom is going to be permeated with the Torah. If you don't like the commandments of God, you're going to hate the kingdom. Okay? So, now, here's the other part that's really important. Because pastors say this. In the Old Testament, you were saved by keeping the law. In the New Testament, you're saved by grace. Nobody was ever saved by keeping the law. The, the, the law was never given to save anybody. Okay? God sent Charlton Heston into Egypt <laughs> and said, I'm going to get you guys out. He didn't say, now here's the commandments, keep them, and I'll get you out. He got them out by the blood of the Lamb. Mm -hmm. And after they were delivered, he said, now here's how we're going to live together. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. The commandments were to keep Israel blessed in the land or removed from the land. Mm -hmm. That was the covenant that God made with Israel. Mm -hmm. He didn't make that. The new covenant isn't ours. Now I'm going to get in trouble. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the new covenant says, this is the covenant I will make with Israel and with Judah. Gentiles aren't mentioned there at all. all right. Thank okay? you. I will write my commandments on their hearts. He's not getting rid of the commandments. Right. He told them to put them on their hearts. They couldn't do it. He had to change the heart. So that's what he's doing. Changes the heart by the Spirit. He'll write the commandments on their heart. They will, all, they will loathe themselves for what they did. And they will walk in the fullness of his glory in that. And you and I, the Gentiles, I don't know who's Jewish and who's not in here. We got in through what Paul calls the mystery of the gospel. The mystery of the gospel said that I was out here, way back out here. And, and, and Israel was way over there. And who, we who were afar off yeah. have now been brought yeah. near and given equal access. Amen. But Jews don't stop being Jews with the covenant requirements that they do because, oh, because that's what God told them to do. And we are brought into some of that. Okay, And uh, Acts 15 begins that work. There are four major essentials that we start with there are other things that we do but that was that was how we were supposed to come in and god never called it the old testament right <laughs> yeah. well uh, well it's 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 an english translation of the book of hebrews sometimes translated former and new so they got the idea of old and new but the in the english bible Old Testament means the Old Testimony, and the New Testament means the New Testimony. They're not against each other. This is the older one. This is the newer one. God began a testimony in Jacob, right? And then he gave a testimony in Yeshua, right? And the book of Hebrews says this one's better, but it didn't replace that one, right? Just like Moses was servant and faithful in the household, but Yeshua was the son in the household, right? So there's there's greater here, but not removal. I like you guys. <laughs> my my, uh, my uh, students look like, you know, Sunday morning about 1159. <laughs> <laughs> right. Now we're right still. <laughs> So, All right, you done with me? Any any other questions? The clock doesn't change, does it? <laughs> it doesn't change much. I, I would like to ask you, 
the question that I like to ask pastors sometimes is what what are you doing to reach oh, yeah. the local Jews, the ones that live in your community? And because we always send money to Israel, we think that's and I'm not saying that's wrong, yeah. but I think it's I think it's both. And so I'm wondering how you approach people and I'm also wondering how do we stay connected but don't give up our individuality um, and that's I mean for me that's because I I love connecting with people because that's to me that's one thing that God he that's what he made us he made us to yeah. be connected and to be relational but so my question is how do we I mean I even asked one for Israel I said would you be willing to support reaching local Jews in the Palm Desert area. And the head of, when for Israel, I'm saying this on, on camera, that he said, no, we're, we, we're collecting money for one for Israel. We're, we're not willing to go. And he actually has spoken. So he's not going to help within his gate? No. Well, he, he, he's actually been in our congregation when we met at another church. The a head of ago. about five years ago, he Pass came and spoke. Through. Some of you may Pass remember through. that. Yeah. But anyway. <laughs> But uh, so anyway, that's my that's my okay. So struggle. let me tell you, I do everything relationally. Right. So I have met because of my family's medical problems. Right. I have met more uh, Jewish nurses and physicians. <laughs> uh, right. My my granddaughter's pediatrician <clears throat> is an Orthodox Jew. Right. My mother-in-law's caregiver was raised in orthodoxy and is now a believer. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. our family gets connected easily. Just look in your relational networks. Right. You, yeah. You'll find them. And out here, oh, yeah. you're going to bump into Jewish people all the time. Every but day. the thing is, you don't go hunting. You, don't, you, don't, you want lures right. on your hat and <laughs> all this stuff. You want genuine relationships with people. And until you have that, I think you gotta be quiet. Uh, we we jump the gun too quickly on people, and, uh, and that I, immunizes I'm, them. I'm I'm still learning that. Like the the two Jewish people I met on Christmas morning, we we talked about the University of Kansas. That's that's we didn't talk about Jesus yet, and we just talked about the University of Kansas. You meet him again, you will. That's well, not that's, necessarily. <laughs> before you plant and before you water, you got to do the spade work, right, and that's right, what you're doing. Right. So I I'm would trying. not rush that. The, the Lord knows what He's doing, yeah. and we're cooperating with Him. We're not doing it for Him. That's right. I I thought we were doing it for Him in yeah. for Christ. We were out hunting. We were headhunters <laughs> yeah. for Jesus, right? Right. Uh, I don't think that works. I don't think it, those people didn't stay. We immunized them to the gospel. So I, I want to I want to genuinely the, if the Lord is working in their heart, you're not you're not going to destroy that by waiting. You may hinder it by pouncing. Mm -hmm. That's, <clears throat> a couple years ago, I I had gone to a Palm Desert Yiddish and uh, I was the only guy, <laughs> and uh, to a friend of mine who got me in because he knew I was interested in Yiddish. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was about 40, 45 people, mostly older, a lot of retired doctors and, and pro professors and that sort of thing. And out of that group, over the couple of years I was in there, there was about, admittedly, about five or six who said, I don't believe in God. Just like that, boom. That one of them, he put his hand on my shoulder and said, so you believe in God? And I said, yes. He said, well, I have to see it and touch it before I can believe it. So I'm wondering what is happening? Why is now these are older guys? And why why did they come to that conclusion? In America, now I'm over generalizing here. Yeah. The Holocaust destroyed the faith of a lot of Jewish people. Mm -hmm. Where is he? Even though they survived, they weren't sure of that, right? A lot of them drove their kids crazy because there has to be a reason why we survive, right? So some of them just tuned God out. They just said, that's it. I'm, I'm out. 
My general response to someone who says they don't believe in God, I, mean, I was on an airplane one time, and a guy said, where do you work? I said, Cal Baptist. He said, oh, I don't believe in God. I said, oh, Neptune, me neither. <laughs> right? Apollo, what a fraud. You know? And he goes, what are you talking about? I said, well, what God don't you believe in? <laughs> and then we began to have a He said, well, what God do you believe in? I said, I believe in the God who made the heavens and the earth. He said, well, who is that? He said, he calls himself the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So, I'll believe in your God until you're ready to talk about it. And then leave it. Don't, you know, we just push too hard. We're not salesmen. We're, we're lights. Lights just ooze light, right? They don't spew wax on everything. We're oil lamps, right? We're not wax. We're not wax. Oh, the Joseph thing. So... All right, well, I hope you have me back, because I'd like to do some teaching. Well, we, we, would, we would love, love, love to have you back, uh, at least from, from my, my humble opinion. So, uh, so.